And without any further ado, then we'll turn it over to Jeff and John and see what our question is. Okay. Well. Thanks for inviting me. Ted, uh, Ted emailed me a little while ago and asked if I'd do a bit of a demonstration and I got thinking about that. And uh, we'll, we'll see how this concept works for you folks. The biggest problem with turning is a lot of people will go out to their shop and oh, I'll, I'll just go out there and I'll, I'll make something. There's, you know, there's no, no idea what they're gonna make. Well, maybe I have an idea. I don't know what I'm gonna do. And uh, I thought it's, what's super important in all this is a concept of, of order of operations. So I have, for the, for the concept, um, I think I have to thank Quinn Dunkey of uh, Blondie Hack. She's a hobby machinist that does precision machining and she brought up that term, order of operations or sequence of operations. And she's always casting shade on uh, wood turners, and, th and that's fine. You know, there, there's there's a whole world. She says below a sixteenth of an inch, <laughs> but for most of us, we really could care less when it gets to that. So order of operations. So tonight, I'm going to make this. What's this? That's about how fuzzy people's ideas are when they go to their shop. They have this, I, I want to make this, but what is it? Oh, um, so in the order of operations, the first thing you got to figure out is your idea. And have a clear idea of what you want to make. This, this talk is more aimed at beginning wood turners or early wood turners because uh, I remember when I was starting out, I, I didn't have any clue. Well, how do you start? You know, what, what, what kind of wood do you look for? So, some of the things you've got to consider, of course, are size. So for tonight, I wanted to make something that was small. Uh, I like to make things that are useful and uh, easy to turn. I had to decide whether it was going to be round or square. Or a, or a spindle, or a rectangle, and uh, so I had a, I clarified that idea. So I want something that's round. But but who says who says you can't turn something that's square? You know, that's uh, what am I at here, John? That's pretty square, and that's turned. That's a different talk. But for beginners, turning something round, like a coaster, off a three inch piece of wood, that's pretty good. Dish it out a bit, part it off the back, that's pretty easy. Uh, turning something like candlestick, this can be turned out of one piece, just a short one. The grain's nice and solid, if you pick the right piece of wood, that works. But what about if you want to turn something like this? This is actually a base or a wine glass. So you can buy them already cut off or you can break your own. And then uh, you have to size this, size this appropriately and epoxy them in. You scar it up a little bit and then stick it in with some epoxy and they're stuck. So I did several of these when I was trying to figure out the shape I wanted. And then uh, when I was happy with the shape to go with the glass, then I made it out of some nice bloodwood or something like that. If you wanted to do something simple, like a little vase, a little bud vase, that's that's a pretty good project. That's a good project for anybody. But but how do you get to this? That's part of the order of operations. What if what if you wanted to make a hollow form? So Jerry may recognize this from about six years ago when we had a workshop on making hollow forms. And he made a bunch of matched up pieces of wood. To make a hollow form like this is way, e I hate hollowing. But this is super easy to make if you do it in two pieces, two pieces. And then 
this is a little embellishment. I learned how to inlay stone. That was fun. But you do something like this in two pieces, different talk. Too complicated for tonight in a lot of ways. This kind of thing, if you turn this out of one piece, this could be quite strong. This is going to be quite weak because this, this could be end grain. So the solution is going to be two pieces. These are things you have to be thinking about with your big idea. One piece of wood, two pieces of wood. So I want to make, I want to make this. I want to make it out of one piece of wood. And uh, I have an idea what shape I want. And I'll come to the shape part of it. So how do I get to that? Well, I have to consider what resources that I have. So for that, I'm going to go to the wood pile. I heard Mike whining about this a few minutes ago. Going to the wood pile. But we all got to do that, right? If you want to see, if you got uh, something you want to make, how big is that one? Particular piece that I want off to the side here. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> I, I have one <laughs> somewhere in here. So here, here's the wood pile. Now, if all you do is dimensional lumber from the the wood store, wood turning ends up being a very expensive hobby because it's all hardwoods and stuff like that. They're they're pricey. And to get two inch thick stuff, that's tough. That, that gets even pricier. So in consideration of this project, I want something that's about an inch, inch and an eighth, inch and a quarter, something like that, because that's commonly available. You can use dimensional lumber. It needs to be about six inches across. And uh, if it had some pretty grain, that's a bonus. So this. I haven't even started turning yet. I'm still working on this. And uh, the second part of this is resources. So we're talking about resources here. So I go to my wood pile. I know what I'm looking for because now I have a fairly clear idea of what it is I want to turn. So I need a piece that's maybe that big. This is, this is birch, but this is only five inch. I happened to draw a circle on this just to see how big it was. I could use a piece of uh, two by material. This is a chunk of two by 10. I don't care for spruce too much. It's a bit soft and it goes yellow after a while. But for a practice piece, for what I want to make. No, not bad. I have some, here's a little piece that's really quite interesting. Let's put it to this side, John, here. So this has some very interesting grain that goes very U-shaped like that. And I could cut a slice off this, and that might be interesting, but this might be more interesting as a bowl. So when you go to your shop with an idea of exactly what you want to make, the other thing that can happen is you go in your shop and say, look at that piece of wood. What can I make out of that? And then that takes you back to your idea. I could make, I could make, I could make this. <laughs> and you live up there. Uh, so here I am looking through my, my wood pile. How do you get stuff like this? Where do you find stuff like this? If you got friends or family who have a 
who have firewood and you aren't raiding their firewood pile, you'd be crazy. <laughs> there is fantastic stuff in firewood. Here's a piece. This one I talked about. I'm putting that away. This guy talked about putting that away. Uh, here's a here's a different uh, here's here's a little uh, rectangular piece. What am I on, John? That one. So this isn't anything special, but that goes back to look at that. I could I, what can I make out of that? So that's a different idea. I'm not going to make this tonight, but this could be. I don't know if that shows up on there very well. This could be a little winged bowl. So a curve like that. So a bowl. <coughs> but you only make the center part of it and then you hollow out you hollow out the top and that's that's a different talk but winged bowls like this they're really cool very very delicate sides that come down on each side and it's as a beginner project it's actually a pretty good project teaching you to watch your depth that's one of those what can i make out of that I was doing a uh, spindle project. Something like this wouldn't be too bad, the top part, because it's nice straight grain. If you got a big knot through it, like these bottom ones here, not so good if you're doing spindles because it's so weak there. And when you look through, you can see some of these go all the way through. So part of this piece might be okay for a spindle project, but that's not what I'm doing tonight. So here's a piece of, I finally dug down to some firewood. Here's a piece of firewood. This nothing special, you know, this literally came off of my wood pile, birch. But I've drawn a circle around two possibilities here. And uh, I'm gonna pass this around, just a piece of firewood, two little, maybe two little, um, Nut bolts or something like that. But one of them is much more interesting than the other. And what you see in one of them is the feather grain that you get by splitting where the branch is. And that's super important. That feather, you got to cut the branch the right way. So here's a piece of wood. The big branch comes out here. Where are we? We're there. So the big branch comes out here. So you split it lengthways through the branch. If you cut across, across this way, you know, across this way, you won't see that feather pattern. This one actually has a really nice one. So, you know, I could use this for my project, um, but it, it might be better using something else. Now, the really important thing about feather if you've got this not very deep, so you have to keep this on the bottom. So this is this is going to make something little, maybe like a plate, maybe a shallow hole. But that's that's gold out of somebody's wood pile. This one's a bit too small. This is crappy old poplar, aspen poplar. Now I can I've got a a bush on my place, a forest. And I can literally just walk through there. There's down poplars all over the place. And I'll go through with a Swede saw or a chainsaw. And I'll find the crotch is what really interests me. And this one, let's go to this end, John. How well does that show? This one has a really big, spectacular feather pattern to it. It's not that thick through here. So this might be a flatter piece. But uh, if this is the bottom, this could really be something. By the way, I'm not taking any of these crotches home tonight. So if somebody wants one, come get it. This, you think, oh, Aspen Poplar, eh, boring. A little bit, little bit of uh, um, Danish oil type stain, wipe on poly, brings this out, it's spectacular. Poplar. It's easy to turn too. So I want something that's about six inch. So this piece is six inch. 
Well, you, this is going home with somebody else too. This looks pretty plain as a piece of wood. I've marked it. I cut this on my bandsaw out of something bigger. Looks pretty plain, but I know something about this piece of wood. This has got a beautiful ripple in it. Really nice. And it gives almost a three-dimensional wave effect. It's really pretty. So I could use that one. Didn't. This is another birch piece with a nice uh, feather in it. I had a piece of, I had a bowl blank. And up here was a great big knot that went all the way through. So I cut that off. I could use this part to make this. <laughs> and uh, that, that was a possibility in case I forgot my. <laughs> this is Manitoba maple. Same thing. Same kind of feather pattern in there. And uh, that one, a little bit of depth here. You could make something interesting, a shallow hole out of that. This one's a bit too small. This has got a ripple in it as well, but only five inches. This is probably birch, might be poplar, but a uh, good practice piece. This would make a nice bowl. This is all out of a wood pile. Just want to remind you. This one was almost for tonight. Uh, had I cut it out, it would have been just right. One piece I wanted to show you. It's rather sad. This is Mayday tree. Mayday is beautiful wood. Uh, used to be quite common in Alberta, but a lot of them are gone with black knot now. I had a whole row of about eight of these and I was able to salvage a little bit. So May Day is just gorgeous. But as you might perceive, this thing is ridiculously cracked. Both ends. And as somebody observed, life is too short for crappy wood. If it's all cracked up, it's not safe. It really is not safe. You're gonna need three masks and armor and everything, because it'll blow apart. Now you can salvage this, and uh, I did a couple of large bowls out of some of the trees, and I had to use a lot of epoxy to fill all the cracks and stuff like that. But it makes a cheap piece of wood a rather expensive piece of wood. But uh, if you can find a May Day that's still alive, rough out the bowl right away, it might help. Or whatever you're gonna make. So sometimes it's just firewood. So refining blanks like that, and that's step three of this whole thing. We haven't turned anything yet. This is still the, you gotta be thinking about this long before you hit the lathe. So step three is refining your blank. If you don't have a bandsaw, you don't have to have one. But for turning, oh, it makes life worth living, I must say. Because uh, you can cut slices off things, you can cut circles, you can cut these square pieces. Oh, you, can, you can turn this square, but it's thunk, 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 thunk for the first while, and you're probably going to split it along the grain somewhere. So that's not so good. So this thing, if you got like a chop saw or a table saw, you draw a circle, you can knock the corners off. And then you have eight sides. Eight sides turns pretty easily. And you can take a little bit more than that. You could use a jigsaw go around it. A bandsaw is way easier. You can use something like a compass. We all used these in school. Most of us did anyway. John's not sure where I should be looking, where you should be looking. <laughs> Compasses work. Uh, I don't know if they sell these in this, this store. I don't even know if you can see that. So this is a plastic thing you can buy, and it's got markings out to eight inches. 
you put it all in the middle, put a pencil in one of the other holes, and it's marked, it's quite clear, uh, and draw your circle, done. And you've got your center marked with the all, bonus. So that's how I did a lot of these, just stick it on. Sometimes you want a square blank if you're going to do those Japanese dishes that are just a very gentle curve and maybe square or rectangular. Uh, unbelievably simple and elegant. Um, Bandsaw is not necessary, or no, a chainsaw is not necessary, or you could buy an electric chainsaw and just use it in your shop, no fumes. They're, they're pretty cheap, they're like 80 bucks or 100 bucks, something like that if you watch. Um, so for this project, I needed a piece that was about six inches. This is seven. Well, that's okay. I can get rid of half inch on each side. I wanted it to be about inch and a quarter thick. So this piece is uh, mostly that way. It's a little thicker on one edge than the other, but not bad. I've got a center mark. So now I'm ready to turn, right? Not quite. Not quite. Because the next thing you got to think about is how the heck are you going to hold it? So this becomes the sequence of turning operations. So we'll call that uh, work holding. That's the part that puzzled me the most when I was a beginner. How do you decide? How do you, do you start at the top? Do you start at the bottom? How, how do you hold it? And a lot of that comes with experience. Some of it comes with, um, you know, finding yourself painted into a corner where you can't work anymore. <laughs> you can't do it, right? You, so it's very helpful if you can work that out in your head ahead of time, okay, I will do this and it'll look like that. Then I flip it over and I can hold it like this and then work it out that way. So typically a bowl, you might start between centers and then in the process you might carve some place for your chuck. If you don't have a chuck, I would really recommend you think about it as you can afford it. It doesn't have to be huge. In fact, most of the time, I just use a little bitty chuck like this. Uh, this is steel. Uh, if you're doing big bowls, you need a bigger chuck and bigger jaws. But this little little Nova chuck, used it for years. It's got quite a sharp edge here. And uh, I, I got no problem with that. So, in this project, my, my ideas are getting a little closer. So I have a pretty clear idea what I want to do in my head, how big it's going to be. It's going to be round. I want it to be useful. I want it to be simple to turn, simple even for anybody. For the experienced turners, this is whole hum, but maybe they never made one of these. So this is a little change bowl. So this is something that's easy to make. Doesn't take a lot of resources. It's a bowl turn, it's basic turning, but it's a little bowl. You could make it out of something that's maybe an inch thick, 4-4 four, four lumber, or better still, a little bit thicker. Teaches you some lathe skills, you can be creative. And wouldn't it be nice if one of those feathers was in the bottom? So that's not going to happen for me tonight, but somebody takes one of these and makes one, then they'll have some fun. So that's what I decided to make. Now turning this doesn't take too long. What sequence have I got to use to turn it? I'll start between centers so that I can get it round and I know where the center axis is. Then somehow I have to mark a place to put my chuck. So, I 
figured Bert wouldn't put a knockout bar for me. So I brung my own. I know with my chuck, I don't know if we're going to see this very easily. I do know with my chuck, not there for safekeeping. If I move my my live center up there, and I find one of my three pencils that I brought. If I put my pencil on the edge of the live center, it goes just about to the edge of that when it's closed. Yes, I brought a key. So these things, as you may have learned or read, these things are strongest when they're gripping something in a circle these kind of chucks. If you got big gaps between the four jaws, you're only grabbing out at the tips of those arcs. So if it's closest to a circle, you got the most part of this arc in contact with your wood. So if I put a pencil on here and hold it, and I cut a mortise just inside that pencil line, this thing's gonna fit. I don't need go no, gauge, go, no go gauges and all that kind of stuff. I just need a pencil in this thing to figure it out. So that's what I'm going to do. So work holding, what I'm going to do is between centers, then I'm going to flip it around and put it in a chuck. And I've decided how I'm going to cut a place for that. I'll do the bottom first, and part of the side. I'll flip it over, put it in the chuck, make sure it's secure in there and centered. Then I'll start working on the top and the inside. Then I can flip it around and finish the bottom. So now I know how I want to hold it. I haven't turned anything yet. So the next thing is, So I got a blue thing going here. So the next thing is tools. What tools do I need to do this? Do I need to buy a whole bunch of new tools? I'm just one tool away from greatness. <laughs> Everybody knows that. This is a bowl, so I have to use tools appropriate for bowl turning. In general terms for most turners, that means a bowl gouge. You don't want to use a spindle gouge or you really, really don't want to use a spindle roughing gouge on a bowl. You can get away with a spindle gouge because it's heavy, but never a spindle roughing gouge because they have a flat narrow tang that comes out of the base of them that goes in the handle and that can snap off and has happened many times. People get hurt when tools break. So you have to use a pool, tool appropriate for the job. This is a, uh, this is, uh, I think this is a half inch or five eighths bowl gouge. It depends whether it's American and they just measure across the whole thing or British, and they just measure across these two little wing things, whatever. I'll use one of those, because it's appropriate for a bowl. And I'm gonna use a parting tool. This is just a regular old uh, prismatic type parting tool. That's all I need, a little bit of sandpaper. So now I've got a clear idea. I went to my wood pile, I found some wood I can use. I'd like to use a piece that has more decoration, but I decided to, to save those for somebody out there. I've shaped my piece of wood so that I can use it. I've thought about how I'm going to hold it so that I can accomplish this, and I know what tools I'm going to use. So I'm almost ready. So I do have to remember to take off my ring. 
and I have to remember about safety equipment. So Bert, you showed that, uh, I think Bert showed that video of his, one of his pieces coming off the lathe, and he had a face mask like this. This is one of those UVEX ones. Over here, John. Uh, I've used one of these for years. Very nice, very comfortable, very light. Safety glasses that are sort of wrap around, we've all seen. They ain't gonna save your teeth or your nose or your cheeks or anything like that. And when wood comes off the lathe, it's dangerous. I recently, after watching Bert's thing, I got uh, this one. This one I got off Amazon, hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> That's what everybody says. This one's made out of polycarbonate. This is uh, impact rated. Super clear, hard to scratch. This is what your usually uh, headlight material is made out of, this polycarbonate. I really like this, really light. So you got to keep your safety equipment in mind. So finally we can get to turning after thinking about all that stuff. Better put this in here. Is this heavy too heavy? Is it going to be unbalanced? Things you got, have I got adequate lighting? Well I don't really but uh, it's like daylight under my lathe. I like lots of light. And, and for the, the younger members, as you get a little older and maybe you get a little bit of cataracts, you need brighter and brighter light. It's just normal. Is there anything on the floor that's going to bother me? No. I'll take my wood out of the way. It's out of the way. And I don't, there's no other local hazards here. None, none of my wel welding gear or gasoline cans or anything right here. So, turning. I don't need this thing yet, because I'm going to start between centers. Now there's a couple of centers you can use. Let's go to this one, John. This is the usual spur center you get with your lathe. This is okay. I personally don't like them. Uh, once in a while I'll use them. For this project, I could use this, uh, but I'm going to use something called a step center. So I probably found this on Amazon as well. They're not very expensive. Morris Taper 2. Morris Taper 2 is what most of the lathes are unless they're really big. So I'll use this. Now some of the clever ones say, how are you going to get your one center mark here? How are you going to get that centered on, on this thing? You know, even if you put it crooked, you can turn it round. Even if you put it off center, you can put it round. But with this thing, thankfully the club slide center is a nice sharp point. Mine doesn't have that. I can push that up. I can eyeball it. And I can see it's not there. I can eyeball it a little bit more. I can see it's sort of wobbling a little bit. I don't know if you can appreciate that on the camera. Yeah, maybe the top one, John. See, it's wobbling a little bit, so it's not quite there. Some of it's because this is thick and this is thin. But you can eyeball down, if you've got a fairly flat face, you can eyeball down it and get it lined up. <laughs> so as it turns out, that's pretty good. So I can tighten that up. My work is secure. If I want to make it really secure, I'll tighten up this thing. I routinely, you get in the habit of unconsciously spinning your work when it's mounted in the lathe. And then you know whether it's hitting something. So my plan is I'm going to flatten the bottom a little bit because I can see this wood is not flat, it's a little fatter on one side. Then I'm going to mark for where my chuck is going to go and I'll show you how I do that. Looks odd but it works. We'll go from there. Fortunately I'm familiar with this lathe because I have the same one, just a lot older. So you, I've already spun it, it's not going to hit anything. I like to start them low 
and then turn it up. Now if you've got a very heavy blank and it's going wah 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 and you've got a one way, if it's heavy enough it'll actually cut out the, the variable frequency drive under here, the VFD. Because they're they don't like the voltage surges, so they're programmed to cut out to save themselves. And then your lathe won't start for a while. You have to actually physically unplug it, leave it for a minute or so, and then plug it in. It took me a while to figure that out in some reading. So with this business, you have got it on maybe on the end one. Though. Oh. So this business, you can, it doesn't really matter, it's like golf. Which club do you use? So I've chosen these two clubs. I could go in from the edge, go like that. Or I could come from the inside. You can hear a shatter of it, but it's going to be better. If I get just the tip pulling in here, there's just the curved part pulling back against the wood. That's called a pull cut. If I'm pushing the same way into the wood, that's a push cut. Shear scraping, you may have heard that one. It's not time for this now, that's a finishing cut. But shear scraping is like shear clip. You drop the handle way down and use the edge. I did make sure my tools were sharp before I came. I didn't mention that under safety. A dull tool is a dangerous tool. It's like a dull knife in the kitchen is dangerous. So this is probably smooth enough for me. The other thing for new people is this red stop button is your friend. When I started turning, I didn't use a stop button that much. I use it a lot now. And they say stop before you move your tool rest and all that stuff. I almost never use this, thank God. This is for when you're really, really panicking and you got to get that thing stopped right now. But I, generally I use this. So I can mark where my chuck's going to go with that. And I see I have a pump there, so I want to get rid of that. It doesn't matter because I'm going to uh, turn that away eventually anyway. So a pencil flat on there, I have my line. So I know I have to uh, move my tool rest back just a little bit because uh, these things like a little space because they're, they're cut back a bit. Here, right? So I can get in there and there's a little hollow here on my lathe, I know it's there and I can get in and I can see it's cutting more or less on center line. So I'll cut that in oh, maybe three sixteenths of an inch, something like that. If it's not quite deep enough, I can always make it deeper. The reason for that because I'm between centers right now. If I took it out and put it back between centers, it's going to stay centered for all intents and purposes. So that's cut. I often get that cut right away at the beginning of a project because I want to know I got somewhere to put the chuck. You know, if some disaster happens, I chip out a big hunk or something like that, but at least I know I can get it in the chuck. So this piece is too big. How fast am I turning it? I have no idea. Fast enough. So I want to make this a little rounder. If I wanted to make a bigger chain pull, I don't have to do this. If I'm doing much of this kind of turning, I will uh, wear gloves. Because the stuff coming off dry I prefer dry wood. And the stuff coming off dry wood is hot. So now I have to decide how am I going to form this thing? And with that, the general rules apply. 
And if you had an idea how you're going to make this thing, then how you're going to cut it should also be in your head as well. But the general rules of two thirds, one third, one third, two thirds, that's one third is close to the golden ratio. Different talk. But uh, I know how big that is. So if my base is about that big, maybe a little bit bigger, that would be a good thing. That's what I'm going for. So a fairly good sized base because you're putting keys and stuff. You don't want a really skinny one because it'll tip over. And on the edge here, the same thing applies. So I like to, for these, I'll put it up, put a line on that's about uh, maybe the top, John. Yeah, hard to see, but this is about a third of the way down from the top, two thirds from the bottom. You decide, could be half half. It's up to you. So now this is rounded up. It's secure in the lathe. I got some place to cut it. I like to get the bottom mostly done when it's like this. I can't finish the bottom because it's between setters, but I'll show you how you can do that. Oh, we can go with that. It's pretty easy to connect the line. I've almost got them connected here now. I can look and see how I'm doing for run out, or for uh, tear out rather. And this is pretty good. It's a sharp tool. You're going to get less tear out if it's a sharp tool. Not quite to my line. I think it looks better if it's straight and not dish for this particular thing. So I want to go across the bottom and just clean that up a little bit. Nice to have the center of your tool at center line. If you're doing a narrower piece and you're using a mortise like this, and the reason I use a mortise and not a tenon is for the wood I use, which is birch and Manitoba maple and poplar, they're not all that hard. And I found a mortise works better than a tenon. I, I find grip tenons and make them just rip out of whatever I'm doing it. And maybe I make them wrong, I don't know. But I've found that mortises work better. And the way I cut this, this is a fairly sharp edged, this is a fairly sharp edged tool or a chuck, as you see there. Get my finger out of the way. So that'll fit in there quite nicely. So for me right now, that's all I can do in the bottom. I could sand it a little bit, but basically, the bottom's done. It's turnaround time. So this is an adapter for this little chuck to fit on this lathe. This is an M33. It's not, uh, you know, a lot of them are one by eight threads per inch. So does this fit, or do I have to go between centers? Oh, look at that, it fits. They say the more you practice, the luckier you get. So I'll do that up most of the way, give it a spin and see if it's running true, see if it's running concentric. And it is, so that's a good thing.
the other part of safety is always, always, always take that out. Lots of turners have got Turner's elbow, and it really, really hurts. Thankfully, I've never done it. My uh, olders and betters reminded me. I've got a bench in front of my lathe, so typically I just put my tools down in front. A little narrow bench. So the shape I'm doing, as you see, is getting closer. I've got the bottom done. I'm coming to this edge. So I'll go up this edge a little bit. I haven't decided where my where the hole's going to be, but that's partly going to be determined by this top edge. So if the top edge is too far down, it's going to affect the hole. The angle of this doesn't really matter. And you notice when I'm taking really heavy cuts, I get big, big old chips. When you're taking really light cuts, you get a lot lighter, a lot lighter stuff. It shows up better against my dressing. There's a lot lighter stuff. It's almost like uh, angel hair. But lighter still is if you're doing shear scraping. You've got your handle dropped down and you're using this cutting side of the, of the bowl gouge. Now that's not super, super straight. I'll give that a little bit. And if you're not getting super, super fine stuff, you're probably either pressing too hard or you haven't dropped your hand down enough. So that's my bottom, and that's my top. Now I get to do the inside. Now part of the problem with bowls on a regular lathe is uh, you're awkward, right? This is bad. It's best if your tool is into your side, and that's pretty easy to do when you're doing the dance on spindles and outsides of balls. But on the insides, unless you have a bowl lathe, it's hard to do. So, oh well. Part of the reason I picked such a simple shape is when you're demonstrating, it's hard to talk and concentrate at the same time, unless you're mental. You can do it. big bowl, you don't want to take it out all the way down to the bottom as you're going. You see, especially if you haven't finished up the rim. If you lose, it'll start to vibrate. So if you hollow it out perfectly, then you go back to work on the rim, it ain't going to work out for you. It'll be a lot of vibration. On a little bowl like this, it doesn't matter so much. Part of the reason for a long handle, you've got a little fulcrum here, and you got a lot of leverage out here. So if you're choking it up like this, you're not helping yourself. Now the experts in the audience are thinking, how is he going to measure the depth of that thing? And you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money on a depth gauge. This is a stick. It's probably as wide as most bowls I make. And a dowel that slides in a hole. So you can eyeball this stuff pretty well, like that. 
So I know that I've gone that deep. And I know, when I look at the outside of the bowl, if I put it on there properly, that I'm only down as far as this little sharp thing. And I also know that I came in a little bit on the bottom. It never hurts to put wood mark or pistol marks on these things, so I know I can't go further than that or else I get a little funnel. And this is where your stop button is your friend. Now if you have an idea that, oh, he's going to catch and something's going to get in trouble and, uh, you know, I can't do it that way, I can't maintain the tip control that's going to fly out and scar up the rim, you can use one of these. Nobody said you couldn't. Get your parting tool, set it back a bit, and you want your hole right there. Why can't you do that? Nobody said you couldn't. And I've seen that uh, recommended many, many times by the you know, professional teachers. You're unsure, or you really, really want it right there, get it started with a parting, with a parting tool. Now how much am I taking out? I'm taking out maybe 8 to 3 sixteenths of an inch in dry birch. I know in the afternoon, about 3.30 or 4, I'm way more aggressive than that. And that's also when I blow things off the lathe. If you find you're pushing too much, sharpen your tool. So this stuff, when you're trying to undercut it like that, this is a problem. And it's cat country. So I'm kind of wondering about now, how deep am I? It turns slower in the middle. It's almost stopped at the very center of anything like this. So you have to cut slower then. I'm kind of well, how deep am I now? Take out my uh, super expensive, Mike knows I like expensive tools. So I'm maybe a quarter of an inch below this, which means I got maybe three eighths of meat here yet. So I can put this flat across here. I've got my, I trapped my dowel when I put it in there, I trapped it with my finger. So I can put it across there and I can see eyeballing that. I got about three-eighths. So I can take a couple of more passes. It doesn't hurt if the base is a little bit thicker. That gives a little more weight to the bottom. And that's not a bad thing. I can line that up again and I got uh, it a little bit further. Another pass. the corner that these are a problem. So you always have a heel where you've sharpened this thing. I don't know if you can even see that. But there's always a heel on the bottom here. And when you're sharpening, if you've got a Wolverine, you can put a little spacer there, maybe three eighths of an inch at the in the in the bottom of the the thing if you're depending how you're doing it. So that if you've got a Wolverine and a very grind jig, it moves the jig ahead. When you move it ahead, then it goes to here. So you can cut uh, a second grind just to get that heel off of there. Because when you're going around a tight corner like this, 
this heel starts rubbing and that's not helpful. And then a big bowl, uh, this, this is not the greatest grind for inside of a bowl, but it, it's what everybody uses. So part of the reason I'm undercutting this is, this is a change bowl. So when you pull your change out, you want it to come and you want it to flip over in your fingers. So I can feel I've got a little bit of ridges on the inside. I think if I try to scrape those out or something, I'm really asking for tear out or trouble. Don't ask how I know. <laughs> and ridge, little ridges like this that you can feel, and you can just see them. The bottom is pretty good. That comes out with sandpaper. I don't want to make a bunch of dust in here, but a um, little bit of sandpaper, and I, I sand fairly slow. If your sandpaper is getting hot, you're hurting the wood. Even that's too bad. You don't give the wood a chance to cut. My little parting tool mark, if I persist with this, I'll get rid of it. And you can dig into that corner a little bit and make it more of a uh, intern. Cutting those, cutting those kind of reverse curves, that's hard. It's hard to do properly. A little bit there, a little bit there. I won't sand too much. Who wants to watch somebody sand? So I can check and see how I've done with my depth. And I got maybe a quarter inch in the bottom. That's not so bad. So, how the heck am I going to finish this thing? I got the bottom. The bottom's ugly right now, right in the center. What the heck? What can I do about that? This bottom's finished. And at home, I might use a vacuum chuck. Those things are fantastic for bowls. Different top. But in this case, finishing this is actually quite easy. And it's easy because I've got a center line. I can center this bowl. How am I going to center it? I need a live center. Got it. I can push it up against this chuck. But this chuck is metal. This is wood. That's a bad combination. You've got a little piece of leatherette, or leather, doesn't matter. You can put it in there. You've got a friction drive now. All right. A little piece of leatherette, stick it in there, and I won't wreck my surface. So I can mount it on my tail stock, lock that in, push it up just a little bit. I'm in business. So maintaining concentricity so it doesn't wobble when you change things is hard. If I was doing a big bowl, I have a couple of chucks, and uh, what I would do with a big bowl is you can buy these kind of adapters. And this one, this is a 1.8. This will screw over this live center like that. And I can put my chuck on here. Put a second chuck on here, mount them up, tighten up the headstock chuck, then I can loosen the tailstock chuck, and it's concentric. It's not going to do that. But you need a second chuck. But I can do something similar with uh, my vacuum chucks. And my vacuum chucks, I, I cut the threads for that to fit the headstock. So it's all wood with some foam on the top and then some uh, piece of pipe in the middle and then lots of, lots of uh, glue. And uh, I seal it as well because wood's pretty porous. 
So I would take the chuck and stick it on this end, have my vacuum chuck going, different talk, line it up. If I got enough vacuum on the vacuum chuck, I take this end off, I'm in business. And you have to be careful. They hold, but they're not like steel. So this one, I can do like this. Put it in there, line it up. Now because I gave myself some room on the base, I, I'm, I can be pretty free with the bottom of this thing. To a point. I like to have a little bit of a rim. So maybe a quarter of an inch. So I can get that started. I don't like to see where I held it with the chuck. I like to try to get rid of that. That's just personal preference. like it complaining. So I can cut in here just a little bit to reduce that thing. That little stemming thing that's left over there. I can sand it right now too. I don't know what that is. Uh, I could sand this right now too. And this is this base is almost done. Well, you say, you know, I may be a beginner, but I know that that doesn't look right. Some people will whittle that kind of thing off. We have a lathe. Another thing your lathe should have is a Jacob's chuck for drilling. And if you've got a little circular disc of sandpaper, you can buy those cheap, cheap. It's mounted on foam. You've got a sander. Even reasonably safe. And this sands off in no time. You keep turning it, and you hopefully won't get a big divot there. And it's best not to try to sand over the whole surface because it's spinning. <laughs> you just want one corner. But if you're not in a hurry, you can get a reasonable finish on that. You can this one down. You can get a reasonably flat finish on that. Bump is gone. And how long did that take? And hopefully you have a Jacob's chuck, but you got to be careful. They do get loose. Some of them want a draw bar, or you got to jam them right in there. What's a draw bar? Uh, some all thread that'll go into this. So a threaded rod. It comes out the other end. And you put, you, so you screw it in here and you screw something on the other end to hold it tight. So other than sanding and some cutting marks, this is done. Now I could have embellished the edges here a little bit. This one I cut in. Just a little bit in here. Uh, I decided not to do that tonight. I haven't made a plain one in a long time. Uh, if I was going to cut that in, I would actually use my carding tool. Just the corner. Make a couple of marks. And then actually you can round over from the center out to those marks. Just a little bit. That's all you need. Or just, just make a couple of V grooves with a, with a corner of this. That's lots. So I had an idea what to do. I wanted to make something that was small, resource not intensive, easy to make. I had a plan for chucking it up. I had lots of wood to choose from to make something. If there was a feather in the bottom of this, it would be spectacular or off to one side. Uh, I know that this wood actually has a little bit of ripple in it because I know the wood it came from. Uh, with a bunch of sanding and 
and uh, whatnot. This, this was a pretty easy to make. You can make these in like 20 minutes if you've got it all worked out ahead of time. So all of this, you think about the night before or that morning or you know whatever. Then finally you get down here to the turning. How are you gonna finish this? That's up to you. I like wipe on poly and I usually finish off the lathe. Uh, wipe on poly is generally durable, it's easy to use, it's very thin, it soaks into birch, takes three or four coats, and it'll buff up with uh, a be-all buff system, it'll look beautiful, really well. Uh, some people like to spray lacquer. Lacquer, when it came in in the 1920s, took over the wood industry. It was so fast, so glossy, shiny cells. The problem with lacquer is it's a surface finish. It doesn't soak into the wood. So I have a beautiful uh, bowl. Well, it's my wife's bowl we bought when we lived in Ontario for a little while, but a black walnut, which at that time was gold. People were digging it out of the bottom of Lake Michigan. It was just gold. A whole black walnut tree disappeared in a park in, in southern Ontario overnight. It's so valuable. So we have this beautiful bowl and the rascal finished it with lacquer and it's peeled off in a big chunk of it. So I can clean it with, with some uh, isopropyl alcohol and respray it, but that's why I don't care for lacquer. Uh, could you just uh, use one of the wax finishes on this? You could. Um, I, I don't really like those because they're not that durable. They look nice. And if you sell it and they wreck it, it's their problem. I don't, I don't sell stuff. I give it away to family and friends. So like, I, li I like a durable finish. Now this is something that as a host or hostess gift or a gift to a relative, easy, useful, cheap, fun to make. Re resource cheap. Only useful if your wife lets you keep your change though. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I hope that has been useful to you folks. Any questions? I'm, ancestry tells me I am ridiculously British, which means uh, like more than 90%. And a whole big chunk of that is Irish, and another big chunk of that is Scottish. So yakking for an hour or whatever it is, and being cheap with the wood, I guess that goes together. <laughs> so, questions, questions, I'm serious. How come we don't have more shavings with that whole box of wood? Mm -hmm. So, uh, there's lots of crotch pieces in here. If you want one, take it. I have many, I have a 30 acres full of this stuff. I can cut down a tree anytime and have another 50. I've got two cords of birch sitting under a tarp and probably, I don't know how many pieces in there, probably a hundred would be suitable for turning. That's, that doesn't even scratch my wood supply, so just take it if you want it. Okay, question. Um, if you're turning green wood from green to finish, like you want to turn a bowl, it's going to be a potato chip. Uh, I, I always use dry wood because what I turn usually is what I get. Even with dry wood, there's a whole bunch of stress and it will move. It, you turn a bowl, it's going to move. I've, I've got some, some big chunks of wood I have to turn a uh, a big bowl for a relative, I'll dry it, that's a different topic, and uh, I'll turn it, but I'll turn it to maybe three quarters of an inch or an inch thick, and I'll leave it for a few weeks, then I'll finish it, and it'll most likely stay round. If you're turning a green blank and you, well, I got all this green wood and I want to get it roughed out and then I want to dry it, uh, some people will take those shavings, throw them in a paper bag, throw the bowl in there, wrap it up, and set it aside for several weeks. 
I worry a little bit about mold. Wood has got it. Um, a better way that's really cheap is to make yourself a warm box. I almost built one. It's nothing. A box. Maybe, you know, a couple of feet square by a couple of feet deep. It doesn't have to be big. And a light bulb. If it's a two feet square, maybe 40 watts, the old incandescent style. An LED won't cut it because they're not hot. And you have to not have anything touching the light bulb. And heat rises, so to get a little circulation, if the light bulb is underneath a screen or something like that, then you might get a little circulation in there. Uh, a warm box like that is very cheap to make. You can make it out of blocks of styrofoam if you want to keep the heat in there. And that'll dry wood out in six to 12 weeks. It'll be dry from green. And it does a pretty good job. It's not perfect. A vacuum kiln is way better and that talk is already on the website. Question? Uh, is there a, actually not a question. I've been drying stuff in my kitchen out under the main car heater with a little thermostat so I can set the temperature that I want. My wife would murder me. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, you're going to ask about microwaves. What about microwaves? That's the modern way to dry. Well, oh, you were so. My, my wife is tough. Just ask Mike. Um, microwaves. I, I looked at microwaves. Seems like a great idea. You, you heat it up and then, you know, and you, check it and you heat it up and you weigh it and you heat it up and you weigh it. And when the weight stops changing, most of the wood is, is pushed out. But uh, you can actually burn the inside of the, the piece and you don't find out until you get in there. Or, you know, if worse comes to worse, you could set it on fire. I, I didn't think that was a great way of drying wood. Uh, warm boxes, you can put several pieces in there, let them dry out if they're rough turned or even if they're green, and they will dry out. Uh, they're, they're not complicated. There's a Canadian guy, Sprague Wood Turning. Uh, he's in Ontario, he does lots of hardwood. He builds them out of fridges, and he's got a YouTube video about building one out of an old fridge. And uh, I thought about that too, and, but I ended up ultimately with a vacuum kiln. And uh, we, we already did that talk. <laughs> the vacuum kiln is magic. Let's see what I can use my old cooler. Yeah, there you go. See, a warm box. Yeah. Another thing that works reasonably well is just a cardboard box. If you're doing you know, half a dozen bowls, green bowls at a time, and uh, put them in an appropriate size cardboard box and it's mostly full. Close it up. Full with shavings and things too, right? Eh? No. No, you just put them in so there's enough the volume. There's enough moisture with all the holes. Yep. And it slowly wicks out through the, uh, yep. through the cardboard. So these guys are way more experienced than me. I, I just cut to a vacuum kiln because what takes people three months or six months or a year, three days. Not kidding. And I'll attest, the vacuum kiln works extremely well. Oh, it's <laughs> magic. Question in the back. Yeah, so I've taken a block, uh, cut it down the center, yep. turned two pieces, one on each side, yep. finished it after it's dry and everything. Why does one side give shape and the other side stays perfect? It's the same There's yeah, there's still, you know, I, I found that so distressing. I have turned wood that, that my moisture meter said is zero. It's dry as toast. And there's still stress in that wood. You turn it out, wood's a living thing. You turn out the center of a bowl, you relieve all those forces in there, it's, it's going to move, and it's so annoying. So if you let it sit at... And the rule of thumb is something like 10% of the diameter, so if you have one foot bowl, one inch, and let it sit for a couple of months and dry out some more. Hopefully it doesn't crack. Then turn it, you increase your odds of having a round bowl that stays round. Yeah, it doesn't crack, it just gives kind of like a, uh, when you look at the rim, yep. kind of see like the, yep. a little bit of a that, that first big piece I showed you with the U-shaped grain, if you look, the top, that thing was cut flat. And it looks like this now. And that's just the wood was flat, and as it dries around a circumference, it starts doing that. 
So if you look at the edge of your bowl, that's what you'll see, is a shape like that. And a, a bowl's turning oval back in the day, when people were using foot-powered lathes, a, an oval bowl like that was pretty normal. So I've got some thicker pieces that yep. give them shape, and I've turned down to a quarter inch. Yep. And not yep. 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 It's so frustrating. The bigger the piece, the more it could move. Other questions? So, there you go. I hope somebody learned something with my uh, order of operations. The order of operations starts way before figuring out the turning. It starts with your idea and working through all that stuff, and it makes it so easy. Oh, okay, so I decided all this. I went out to my workshop. Okay, here's a piece. That's what I'll use. And I did a, I thought, well, I better practice this. So I practiced once, so I have another one of these sitting at home. And I'll give that away to finish it, give it away to somebody. And uh, then I found some other nice looking pieces that uh, maybe somebody would like to have and try on their own. So that's it. Have, have fun at the break. <laughs>
At any rate, you can use your chainsaw as a chop saw and a big piece of wood to hack it in half. Super easy, it's safe. You just run it down a piece of two by four as you're working your way down with a chainsaw. Electric, you know, 110, no fumes, works. So yeah, if you're cutting on a bandsaw, use a jig. As you're cutting in like this, since the blade's going down, it's gonna wanna go like that. And as you're coming out the other side, it's gonna come towards you. And it'll probably bend your blade. <laughs> Any questions about feather? Anybody didn't know that already? <laughs>